Yeah. Yeah. One, two, three, and yeah. 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 You know I walk these streets at night and I look for a fight. Look, cause I don't have nobody in my heart to give me what's wrong from right. <laughs> that was pretty good, wasn't it? It was a comment. It started off Metallica, then ended up like, like uh, one of those, like, 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 uh, uh, I don't know, Breaking Benjamin. I don't know. That's what it sounded like. Anyway, bro, <laughs> it's BT Tales from the Gemini. So excited. We're about to, man, we're about to get it going right now. Uh, my neck, my first guest is, um, you know, like I try to make this. Like, it's always inspiration or somebody I look up to. And uh, first of all, thanks for the shout out for the uh, Sean Dillon Kelly um, uh, uh, chat that I had with, um, with Sean Dillon Kelly. And everybody hit me up on that and said how much they loved it. And so did this guest here. So thank you guys for, so much for that. I do the best I can. I take constructive criticism, whatever. I'm not just a, you know, a pat on the back kind of guy. I take it all, man. So I just appreciate you guys reaching out to me, telling me how much you love that. Even his dad hit me up, man. That's a that's a hit me in my heart, man. His dad hit me up on that, Malik. His dad said, "Hey, man, uh, that was a great interview we did with my son." Blah blah blah. I ain't gonna lie, man. That shit got me all choked up, bro. Cause I mean, I know how t how tight he and his dad are, and that shit hit me, man. I don't know. I think it's because I know I don't have any kids, and I'm not gonna have any. You know, I mean, seriously. So it's like. Ah, so it's like I missed that. Plus, my dad, you know, me and my dad, we still love each other, but, you know, I haven't seen him in a while, and, you know, we're past that stage, so it's like, oh, man, so it hit me in the heart. So thank you guys for the comments and everything. And, uh, hey, man, let's send the link right now so we can get the, my guest. Uh, so, yeah, so let's just send the link right now. You know, it's my favorite part. Let's send the link right now to my guest. And I got to make sure he's, uh, he knows I'm coming. I get my phone. Uh, this part, I, I love this part here. I know it seems so unprofessional, but I love it. Because, you know, like I said, you know, when we get to the big time or whatever, and then we won't have the link, uh, they'll be either right here or something like that. It'll be like real professional, professional. And we'll be like, oh, man, you know what I mean? We'll miss these times where it was like, you know, you know, like, like a diamond in the rough. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? I like that because you know what we're doing here and what people love is, man, we're trying and we're doing things, man. It's like, and it, nobody ever, you can say what you want about people, but people always respect the hustle. I mean, you can hate somebody for whatever. You don't, you don't think this is professional? No, it is professional. What I'm saying is we can wait for the link. You know, like oh, you've watched Dan Patrick. You don't have to wait for the link of Dan Patrick or whatever. But so right. I'm going to hear. See, that's what I love about this, man. When you do this, I love this. This is the part I love. Okay. Did he hit the link? Did he hit it? Not yet. Okay. I'm, I'm going to say right now. We sent it. Sending now. I'm, I'm going to put it right oh, now. Oh, he does? Okay. Come on, Matt. Come on, Matt. Come on, buddy. Uh, ask him about the dark one. <laughs> okay. Uh, come on. Okay, All right, here we go. Come on, come on. <laughs> there he is. Yay! What's up, buddy? How's it going? Matt, hey, I, uh, turn it. There you go. Okay. Where, where'd you go? You got me? Yeah, I got you, but you're all you like this. Me? Now we're like this. We're, I got to talk I'm to you. Like, wait, this. wait, wait. Do you need to have good, uh, like, vertical? Is there you go. There you <laughs> How you doing, Matt? Yeah, is that better? That is great. How are you, buddy? Yeah, not bad. How's you? Um, Find me. I can, uh, I can see you now. Um, I've got you propped up on, like, loads of um, encyclopedias, which I've stolen <laughs> from our uh, hosts that we live here. There's one on, there's one on China. Latvia, I love this dude. LA, it's pretty I, cool. I love this dude. This uh, tells from Gemini. This is my guest, Matt Dunn. This guy is living the dream, and I think you would love my producer. My producer, I tell everybody, my, the people who I get along with the best with, the people I get along with the best with, for some reason, are lesbians and young white kids. And my producer is 19 year old white kid, and you, I, you're 26, but you look younger. You sound like you're 18 or 19. And so, yeah, it, yeah, everyone says that. And I swear to God, it's like in 2018, I'm watching MotoGP, and it's, and it's Moto3, and I'm expecting my buddy Steve Day, and all of a sudden I hear this voice, and I go, wait a minute. And I know you probably Who's heard this, this child they've let on. And, <laughs> and I go, wait a minute. And I'm listening, and I'm going, okay, it's different. I'm going, okay. And what I love about you, man, is like I see me and you is that 
and, and don't take, take it the wrong way, but you're living the dream. Like, because you didn't expect yeah. to be there and you're there. You're living the dream job. And, that, and that's what I love about you. And you show your excitement. The only thing I don't like, man, is that you're so mean to, uh, you're so mean to your counterpart. Why are you so mean to Neil? Neil, no, Neil's mean to me. He's the one who roasts me all the time, and rightly so. <laughs> no, because you said Neil's, last week, I heard you go. everything going for him. He, he's got the Barry White voice. He's really tall. He's good looking. He's, he's Northern Irish. I'm from Southern England, so everyone takes the piss out of me, and I look 18 when I'm 26. It's, he's fair game, not me. <laughs> yeah, but you said, shut up, Neil. Man, that was the funniest. It was last, last week. <laughs> it was during the race. He goes, shut up, Neil. And I laughed. And I laughed and I laughed because you told him to shut up and Neil didn't say another word. And it was yeah, the funniest thing. So for, for, people, for people who don't know you, let's go back. You started out, you were, you were, what I love about you is that you were, you were definitely a millennial because you started, you were a social media editor for MotoGP. Right, and, yeah. but you but you've done it all, and that's what the weird thing about it is you're a social media editor. You were into soccer, everything else. I'm trying to find out where where the love for motorcycles came in to put you where you are in now, the position you're in now. Uh, um, well, oh, hang on, you got a bit slow there. Are you there? Can I'm I, still here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, uh, well, it came from my my dad and my uncle. My dad got me into into motorcycle racing when from when I was yay old. I went to my first motorbike race when I was. Um, when I was four in 1998, it was British Superbikes at Thruxton, the best circuit on the planet. Nah, um, watched Cadwell. Neil McKenzie and Steve Hislop on the Cadbury Boost Yamahas battle it out on the Yamaha 750. <sighs> uh, I got on TV that day. I think we still got the VHS where we recorded over it. You can see me waving like a red jacket. A VHS. Um, man, I was hooked ever since then. And I think, I think, uh, well, British Superbikes, World Superbikes was my jam until uh, was like as I was growing up in the early 2000s. And then uh, MotoGP came into it, I would say, probably around 2007-ish. Uh, but my first, like, specific race, that races that I remember watching um, were actually at, like, a friend's, my parents' friend's New Year, uh, like, party around in March. I think it was his, like, his birthday. And they had this massive cinema room. The guy was quite wealthy. And uh, I asked, I was one of the younger people at the party, so I was like, can I put on the TV, please? And I saw that MotoGP was having an FP1 in Qatar. Yeah. It was in 2008, the first year they went under the lights. Yes. And I was just, like, amazed by the colors of, of the racing at Qatar at night and things like that. And so that's where it, that's where it started, and it, it just built from there, really. I think it's beautiful. I mean, honestly, the best play, the best way to get addicted, and MotoGP does it perfect, is kicking off the season opener in Qatar under the lights. You can't beat yeah. that. The bikes look so much more beautiful, and it sets oh, an ambiance. Yeah. You know, it's just a beautiful yeah, yeah. ambiance. Um, I think it was like when, when I first went there, I went there for the MotoGP test because they wanted to, um, the, the preseason test, because that was before I'd done a, a session of commentary, and they wanted to give me some experience of being there on site. Uh, like properly i've been to a, a couple of races before but not properly on the sort of tv side and um yeah just going in pit lane to get some social media photos and videos i was like my god these bikes look amazing under these lights it's astounding now, have you ever tried to race yourself at one time no the no, no, last experience i had on a motorbike was uh, one of my good friends um i threw his 100 cc motocross bike into his hedge um <laughs> as i was coming out of a hairpin in his garden uh, but no, it's one of those things where I, I, I really want to do it. And I'm, 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 not, I, I'm not one of these people who's like, oh, no, I'm the wrong side of 25. I'm getting old. I don't think I'm getting old. I mean, look at me. I look 18. <laughs> but I'm get, I am conscious that I'm 26 and I've not had enough experience on the actual motorcycle. You know, that's something which, you know, to start to, you know, to save money and things like that. I want to try and find my way of actually getting to ride a bit more. That's, that's a goal. Or, you know convince the bosses to make us do a video about teaching me how to how to how to ride a bike that's Great what I'm idea, saying. Right? you do moto three those guys are only what four years younger than you or yeah. john john mcphee's about your age so is albert arenas get those guys i mean what a great piece of video have those guys teach yeah. you how to ride and you steal one of those red bull rookie cups bikes and, and what, <laughs> what are those guys gonna do they're 13 anyway what are they gonna do fight you yeah. so what you do is get on one of those bikes teach you how to ride what a great segment that would be yeah, I yeah, know. Well, no, I mean, to be fair, um, uh, old Crapa, um has, has given a, an offer as well. Like at some point he said, if you ever get, we ever find time in our calendar, he's like, I'd love to show you around and teach you how to ride and things like that. So, yeah, I think it, it's going to happen one day. I don't know, it's not as if I'm scared of it or anything like that. It's just the time, the money, the resources, finding a way. Because if you can't afford it, you've got to find someone who will lend you a bike, right? <laughs> so. And don't send it into the hedge. <laughs> don't send it to yeah, the yeah, hedge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's probably the biggest thing, eh? I felt cool anyways, a little 100cc thing. <laughs>
I swear, Matt, you kill me with and everything you do. You kill me because <laughs> it's 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 so it's authentic. I mean, it's organic, and I love it, man. I love your enthusiasm. But tell me how you came up. Even though you loved it, how did you come up and end up working for Dorna? Because I mean, let's go back to where you're growing up as a kid. You're playing uh, football was your first love, right? Uh, well, actually, my, no. To be fair, my first love was um, was motorcycle racing, really. But like, it was just going to the races, like begging the parents, "Can we go to five races this year, please? Can we go to six races? Can we hit, can we throw in a world superbike race this year, please?" Because, you know, world superbikes was definitely expensive. Right. Um, back then, I don't know what the ticket prices are like now, but yeah, back then it was insane. Not it wasn't being run under my current employer, so <laughs> I can get away saying that. Um, and uh, but my first, I did the, uh, I was just a part of a um. Uh, local football uh, academy really for the local football club and then I got kind of bored with um, I was get, I was actually getting too old to still be taught and it was my like weekly exercise and shit so I just carried on um, and actually became a coach in that like a voluntary coach that just sort of helped me working with people I guess but my actual my second love which was the thing I guess that taught me about uh, what do we call this like performing public speaking i guess you'd call it right okay. is uh, when i got into falconry that was my thing um so like i'd got work experience working with birds of prey and then i was doing falconry displays and talking to people about something which i was becoming an expert in and that communication of something that i'm a i'm an expert in is how is what led me to get the skills not that many skills but <laughs> skilled enough uh, to do what I do today, basically. Now, you talk about the birds of prey. That's what that to me is the part that like it, it doesn't fit to me. I mean, look on the outside, yeah. looking at it, it doesn't fit like birds of prey and MotoGP or motorcycle. How did that? How do those two like kind of like combine into one, like a minotaur? Uh, kind of, <laughs> kind of, kind of separately. Like I got the the bird of prey thing was a funny story because when I was um, we had to do in England. I don't know what you guys have in the US, but when we get to uh, what's called secondary school so when you're 12 to 16 years old uh, no 11 11 16 years old i think um you uh you have to do a think of work experience in one of your final years when you're like 15 years old so two weeks work experience and i managed to get one at this falconry center because we like he came and did some display uh bless him his name is uh phil old and god rest his soul um he he came to display at my my dad's allotment and then my mum asked him them, and, and I asked him, like, can I do work experience with you in, like, four years? And he was like, sure. And then by chance, <laughs> when we came around to looking for it, my mum found him at the local garden centre and said, hey, you said to my son, he can do work experience with you. Is that still on? He was like, sure, no problem. Well, actually, because he's from Hereford in, uh, in England, he went, sure, like that, like a big old farmer. And, uh, and so I, I went and did that for two weeks and then was like, you know what? This is really fun. Let's keep at it. And it was just separate, but... To be honest, when like I remember um, uh, when I was in my last year of doing it in like 2014 to 2015, I um, I was pitted like the blogging of motorcycle racing side, which is what I was doing with a, a site called Paddock Chatter. I think it's now called Racing Lowdown. Okay. By, uh, Steve English runs it. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I started doing that, I was sort of starting to tell people like, so what do you do outside of working with birds? And I was like, well, I'm at university and also I'm really into motorbike racing. So I'm hoping to get a career in that someday. And they were always like, why, why, where does that come in and stuff like that? And I was like, well, to be honest, when it comes to things like falcons, which are like the, the, the speedy uh, creatures of, of the bird of prey world, well, those guys go at like, well, depending on what species of falcon, they can fly up to 250 miles an hour. Wow. Um, are you serious? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, and lots of, so many modern engineering, like the principle of the jet engine is, is actually semi-based on the nostrils of a peregrine falcon. So you, where, where are you? Are you in New York or something? No, I'm in Indianapolis. Your, Indianapolis. India, no way. Nice. Yes. Hey, did you go to, did you go to Motor America last week? Check this out. All right. I've only worked four times this year, right? As a stand up. Only four times. The, right? The fourth time I worked was the week that Moto America was in town. So I flew, oh. I flew out when they were coming in. When I came in, uh, the race was over, and they were already locked up and gone, man. All my friends were in town when I wasn't here. I had planned on riding motorcycles with Brandon Posh. I just, you know, e interviewed a SDK. I was looking forward to yeah, hanging yeah. out with him. Those guys gone. When I came in, they had 
already gone. So yeah, that, oh, that that's my life. What about what about the um? When was the flat track there? Was that like a couple of weeks ago too? I missed the flat track also. I missed everything. I've missed everything. I know. I know. Disappointed. I, 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 you I know. Get any opportunities in in 2020, and you missed two of them. Well, well, thanks for rubbing it in, man. Thanks for rubbing it in. I mean, seriously, you know, it's not my fault. I mean, I had to work. I had no, to make but, that money. You know, fair play. You you got to earn your money. You got to, you know whatever your career is, especially in these times, you got to do it, right? Exactly. You. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. I was gonna say you keep on, and I'm gonna say, tell but, you go to bed because I've got a couple years on you. I tell you to go to bed. <laughs> but um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> but um, but no. Uh, where was I about the? About oh yeah. The, so falcons and things like that. So oh yeah. So peregrine falcons. Um, so you see them in like every modern city in the world. They're amazing, amazing adaptable creatures because they grew up and like evolved on on cliff ledges and and things like this coastal areas. And now you've basically got modern man-made cliff edges are like buildings, right? Right. Um. Yeah. So, uh, so basically, like very, very simply put, and this is this is good. I'm enjoying doing this because I've not sort of talked about these things. In, <laughs> I can tell. I can tell. So I'm letting yeah, you go. Yeah. Go with it. Um, peregrine falcons. So the, their nostrils are what is the same sort of principle as a jet engine, and it's kind of what a jet engine was based around. So if you look at their nostrils, they're like sort of a circle like that, and they've got little knots in between. And if you had a real good look inside of it, it looks like a honeycomb effect. But the notch. What it does is because they they travel at about 250 miles an hour, I think 253 mile an hour is like the fastest ever recorded speed when they're diving or stooping. Um, what that notch does is it slows the airflow down so their lungs don't explode. And so the principle of a jet engine is it slows the air down when it comes into the turbines and then very, very, very basic principle from what I understand is it then pushes it out like three times, however many times faster to actually make the jet engine work, right? So that's where they took it from. And then... Yeah, so you just see with with that's like just falcons and speed and the look and the maneuvers. Like, if, there's this um, classic falconry is when you fly an actual falcon and you you basically set them off. They're out soaring around and you've got this long line uh, with a bit of with some feathers on, a bit of a leather pad and some food, and it's called a lure, L-U-R-E, right? And you're swinging it around, and the point is that the falcon is swooping around around and comes in and tries to take that from you with its with its legs like it's chasing a bird in the wild right um and when you see some of the we had photographers come and take photos of the birds when they were doing this and some of the shapes you see and stuff like this it's the same principle as why we all love racing it gets that sort of like how the fuck can these things do that and it's the same with motorbike racing it's, wow. it's the look the feel the speed the rush the, when it, a rush of when a bird comes past you at 180 miles an hour yes it's the same that you get when you're at the Alaman tt and the motorcycle comes past you clipping hedgerows at 180 miles an hour. It's the same thing. <sighs> That's, I never thought of it that way, but we all respect yeah. the speed, and we all love the speed. No matter what it is, you respect and love the speed. Exactly. Okay, so uh, uh, falcon or a bald eagle? <laughs> uh, falcon, because the bald eagles are lazy. They, uh, I think it was Benjamin Franklin, nearly, uh, he wanted to replace, or, to, or when there was, they were initially having the vote about what should be the national bird of the U.S. I think it might have been Benjamin Franklin, who was like, nah, fuck you, bald eagles. They're lazy. They're opportunists. I want a turkey. A turkey is really earns its food properly. Like a, a bald eagle goes and scavenges and things like that. Like they're great hunters. They can be, but it does take scavenging any day. And he was like, they look mean, but that's not that's not the spirit of the American people. A turkey earns its corn <laughs> a lot more. That's incredible. Than a bald eagle. This guy's tell us more about our How country about than we knew. Okay, so basically, we should have a we should have a turkey. On our court. Plus, we're fat people anyway. So that'd be, that would be <laughs> so perfect for the United States, wouldn't it? We're fat, lazy people, and the turkey would perfectly represent. Like, it's Thanksgiving pretty much every weekend anyway here anyway. I don't know why we, we do it in November. I mean, every weekend is Thanksgiving. You, so that's, you told us more about our country than we know. Even my producer, Wyatt, <laughs> who knows everything, he's like, I didn't know that. Oh, my God. Thank you, man. I appreciate yeah. that. Wow. No worries. No worries. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, no, birds of prey are great. And, um. No, that's uh, that's something which I like. I've let it go to the side of, of my life lately mm -hmm. in the last few years because, especially this year, has been so full on with work. That it's something that when I go and visit England and things like this, I always try and find time. I've got friends who own owls and falcons and hawks. I like to go and see them, see how they're doing, how their birds that I what know since they were like chicks and hatched from an egg, how they're doing. And then I go to like bird of prey and just go and see it. I love it still. It's it's one of my favorite things. I'm not gonna lie. I, I this is for the first time in my whole life. I can't believe I'm saying this. Is that you kind of make me want to go 
and look at birds now in a different way. And I mean, if I'm not even kissing ass, I'm going, you know, I kind of yeah. want to look at birds. You know what? If we ever, and we will, if we ever hook up again, we're going to do that. I'm going to go, I swear, I swear yeah. we're going to go bird watching. He's going to meet you and we'll get well, Simon no, Patterson. I know, I know the place I want to go in, in the US is like, so there's a few people I follow on Instagram um, who've got like bird of prey recover, uh, rehabilitation centers in the US. And I've got to go there. I want to go see them. We'll, we'll, we'll okay. do that. We'll do, I'll pick you up and we'll go together. How about that? Deal. And if Don't, I'm and if done. I'm in, and if I'm in Europe, we'll get Simon Patterson. We'll get in his van. He'll make pizza for us, and we'll all, we'll all go together. How about that? <laughs> how about that? Perfect, mate. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, so now, how did you happen to like want to work for a MotoGP and getting the, and getting the job? Because you start off in the social media area. And by the way, congratulations! You took MotoGP from what less than twenty million followers to thirty million in less than five years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's fortunately like around me, there's so many really capable people. When I first started, it was I was the editor, uh, the social media editor, and then there was the social media coordinator called Gorky Yort, who's now like a, he's like the digital media uh, manager, something like that. I think is his official title. Um, it was just us two in 2016, and then after that, we've got a guy called Nar McGlone on board the next year, and. And we've sort of been building from there. And now we've got a team of, I, I, can't, I really can't name them all because I'm talking about the amazing job which everyone's done because we'd be here two hours. Um, but now we're literally a team of like 15, 16 people, I think, all in, including some freelance video editors. Wow. Um, and, and that's and, all you, brother. Like, that's all you. I mean, you and no, your team, no. but so, yes, it is. Oh, come on now. It's far, it's far from all me. I like, I did, no, I, I like to think, and, and I don't mind, I've come to sort of to terms with trying to, um, to sort of admit it because I like I don't like to take credit for a lot of things there's a couple of things and like a couple of principles which I helped install or like come up with um with a lot of the the managers and directors and stuff above me which I, like I, I would say okay without me being there that would have been delayed by a few weeks mm. uh, <laughs> but <laughs> the thing is like I I was the first one to use emojis on yes. the GP official social media channels. So you're the emoji you know? guy. Did you make an emoji up for story. you? Did you make one up for you? Like well, a guy with glasses, like with, with like a fro or whatever? And, and well, well, you know the you know the emoji which just has the glasses, it's the same as my glasses. <laughs> you see, so. so that's you? Yeah, and with with the T as well. <laughs> it's, it's basically me, that's why I always use it. But um <laughs> but no, it's, it's funny, just tell you what, it's a good story. Actually, first using emojis. Um, I, I did uh, like a, coming on this. Obviously, as an employee, I can't talk too much about internal work. But I think it's quite a funny story. Um, I, won't, I won't tell. When MotoGP did a test in Australia, a preseason test, I think it was 20, 2016. Yeah, because I joined, I joined in October 2015. Uh, my first proper day on the job working in Barcelona was the day after the season finale in Valencia, and then it was just like preparing stuff for the for the season. So yeah, February comes around. And the Australian test is going on, and the test wasn't televised then. It's not like it is now with this amazing like coverage with after the flag with all those guys there. It was like there was there was cameras there, but there was no live feed because that's goddamn expensive to send that to the other side of the world, right? Right, right, right. Um, and uh, so they were like, Matt, we need you to stay up during the night to do a couple of live timing updates from the test. I was like, no worries. Um, like this is pretty cool. So I was in my dressing gown and my underwear, just sat on the thing, just tweeting away from Mert GP, giving some updates, waiting for some photos to come in. There was a guy, I think his name's Paul Robinson. He's like, he's a he's a, a photographer over in the US, uh, over in Australia, and he was um, yeah he was sending me some photos, and I was like so it was like two in the morning. I was really kind of kind of pissed off because it was me awake working, and then one of the guys who was in charge of the website at the time called James Keane. So I was chatting to him, and I was like. God, I haven't got any photos coming in. I have to do screenshots of the live time. And this is so boring. Like, if people are watching this Twitter coverage, it sucks. Like, it's so bland. Yeah. What can I do? And I remember, asked, I think I asked her the week before, could I start using emojis? And I remember my boss at the time, Mitch, went, no, nah, I don't think we're ready for that yet. We're not ready for that yet. <laughs> and I was just like, to be honest, I'm just going to do it. Because no one's asleep. everyone's asleep. No one's going to bollock me now. So let's just start using emojis and, and find some ways to make this more eye-catching on people's timelines because Twitter was a different world back then. Right. And so I did. And then the first message I get at like 7.30 in the morning, maybe even early, probably like 7. And it's just like, MotoGP's never used emojis before. <laughs> Tonight. <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, I couldn't find any ways to make the coverage interesting. So um, I, made this, I made the decision for us. And they were like... <sighs> Okay, <laughs> and that was it. So yeah, now, a couple of things like that, like, but they're all things which should have happened anyways, because we're moving in in the time, in the space of the world, and man, like, there's so many. Donna are so effing lucky 
and fortunate with how many driven people, like especially Brits, take nothing away from my, my dear colleagues who are from Barcelona, but like how many driven Brits who want to work in this industry come over from the UK because they're all fucking amazing. Like, yeah, really. Honestly, and, and, and what I always say is you have to have that young energy to have to have that enthusiasm because enthusiasm when enthusiasm meets passion and they're synonymous, mm. but when enthusiasm meets passion, man, you're going to, you're going to make, you're going to make magic is what you're going to do. And, and if you don't make magic, it's going to be close to it. I mean, it may not be perfect, but you're moving in the right direction because you can't have people to me personally. I mean, it's except to the rule like myself, but you can't have people over 40 or 45, you know, going, this is what it's going to be. What it's always going to be. Cause it's not going to work. You got to get people who go in like, this is what I want to do. And you pay them peanuts or whatever, but they're going to work with passion and, 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 and enthusiasm. And look what you've done with, with past the, Mike is one of my favorites. I oh, yeah, love like that. that. Man, dude, I love that. Pastor Mike is one of my favorite things to watch in the world. I love watching the Bender Brothers. Those two made me laugh. That's watching um, uh, Jamie Massia and Jorge Martin and, and watching um, Miller and Maverick. And let me tell you something. I listened to Maverick Vignala's interview again, and I love what you did because it's like, and I want to ask you this, like, what was your old shit moment? Like, because to me, personally, I've been in the, in the, uh, the post-race press conferences. And the first one, I tell people, I performed in front of thousands. I've done, you know, theaters, whatever. And I opened up for big names. But nothing made me more nervous than asking a question to Valentino Rossi after a race. <laughs> and you can tell he's a little prickly. And, I'm just, and you're in that room with him. And he's eyeing you. And you're like. Especially <laughs> when you're a new face. Yes. Right? When you yes. New face, they, they they have this thing. The riders is like, if they see your new face, they're looking at you weirdly. They're like, who are you? What do you want? Where are you from? <laughs> Who's employed you? Who's asked you to be here? Like, it's, it, it's just written on their face, isn't it? You know. So when when was your like what, what was your like 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 oh shit moment? This is it. Like, is any who intimidated you the most as, as far as when they walked through the door or you had them on the line like I have you and you go oh boy, oh boy or or has it or is it has it ever happened? Um, yeah, it happens. It happens a lot, to be honest. Um, uh, I mean, it happens ne- like I mean, it happened the other week when me and Fran were doing the podcast with Dovey. Like, I was going to ask you that because Dovey, you know, Dovey's a little different because Dovey comes out and says he doesn't like the media. He'll, I mean, he doesn't. It's, yeah, yeah. it's not so much personal. He just doesn't like doing media. And he and he told Steve. I remember. I think Steve got offended when he said that. He goes, "Yeah, I don't want to be here." Or whatever. Yeah, Steve, did, Steve didn't like that because Steve. We all love Dovey. Everyone in like Dorna. I don't think there's anybody who dislikes him. And Steve. So they, I think Steve bless him to hear that Dovey's like don't like press conference. Steve's yeah. like, but that's my thing. <laughs> and then they're like, Dovey's. I don't like it. He's like, oh. <laughs> but Dovey likes him. Sure. Like, Steve got butthurt over that. I thought that was funny. I thought yeah, that yeah. was hilarious. So, yeah, has, has there been somebody that you were like, oh, God, I got to make sure these questions are on point because they can make me. And, and then those, and, and I'm, to their I'm co- not a light teacher, dude, like, to be honest. The, uh, the, the, so, the way when you first start traveling as, as like one of the Brits and stuff, if you're working in the communications thing, one of the first things they make you do is you go and you go and do some interviews, like some of the news style interviews with the microphone and things like that. Every single one, I was fucking breaking it. And I think it took me. I think, honestly, I think it genuinely took me about half a year to a year to stop fucking up the questions and sound like a bit of an idiot. Like, for real, it was, it was, uh, I mean, yeah, it's just, it's just complete just repetition and stuff. And, and even today, I get a little bit, ner- I get less nervous around things. I, and when we saw the podcast, the latest podcast came out yesterday with um, Johan Zarco. Zarco. Yeah, that was and good. I was, good I job. I completely tell you, I was just, that was the first, probably one of the first times I've literally sat down and just not been nervous whatsoever I, I don't get to you know the only thing i get nervous about these days is not speaking to people i get nervous that the equipment is going to mess up i'm so i was so nervous before this pace and i had like three nervous wheeze beforehand the last half an hour because i was like the link needs to work yeah. you know and i was and thinking the same way i was thinking the same way because i got here and usually my producer and the sound guy are here before me but for some reason they weren't for a quick second and usually i go to starbucks and i come back but i was texting yeah. and i didn't get nothing I go, oh man and i start getting nervous at that nervous you know that cold feeling in your legs Kind of like when like you have a suspended license and a cop makes that U turn and and like oh man I'm going to jail so yeah, I had that feeling in my legs and then I came in I saw them here I go okay good and then I saw you have the message I go okay we're good but I had that same feeling so but let me tell you so that Zarco interview was great and I love cool, right? I think Zarco and Lorenzo are the most underrated I mean uh, misunderstood guys in the paddock I really think they are especially yeah. Zarco now especially Zarco now. 
yeah, yeah. And I love what, how you, you mean after like Austria and stuff. Or? Well, you know, even before, remember now when I talked about Rossi being prickly, that was when uh, Zarco did that move on him in, in Austin. Remember? And, and, yeah. and Balai goes, This is not Moto 2. Yeah, he goes, This is a Moto 2. And he said it like you could tell he was pissed. He goes, This is a Moto 2. And I was like, Oh, man, he's mad. And I, and I think, and I forget what question I asked him. And, and he was like, And he said, The championship didn't start till we get to Europe. And I was like, All right, man. And I was like, okay, man, gotcha, you know? Yeah, yeah, but the yeah. next year was great because in a way, in a way, I was kind of like, fuck you. Because I go, hey, remember last year in your words, you said, and I said that to him, but he was happy because he got a podium. So he was happy that year. But I bought his own words back to him so he couldn't say anything. So, but man, uh-huh. I was, but I was so nervous. But yeah, that Zarko interview was great. So how do you like approach that, especially the Maverick interview? Because we all know Maverick. Maverick, in a way, is kind of misunderstood. But I, for some reason, I always say Bradley Smith is my, fa- I mean, Brian and Bradley, that's my dude. I always call him my, my boy he calls me pop that's yeah he, my, follow, he follows you on instagram doesn't he I lo- yes i love that dude we he go back him. and forth before the race says hey man go, hey, i go good luck son he go thanks pops oh, you know what i mean nice. so yeah pops. yeah he <laughs> called me pop he, because it was uh during my uh my 50th birthday i went to i went to had i did my first Wait, track how old are you i'm 52 no yeah, I'm 52. Black don't crack. I thought you were like early 40. Oh, thank you, man. Black don't crack, though. See, you guys don't understand it, but see, black don't crack. That's it, the thing here in the United States. You know, you know about birds. I know about black people, and we don't crack. Like, I, yeah, that's why I go out with like 26 year old girls. So it's like, yeah. So we can go double dating sometime if you want to. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me, dude. No worries. We're all good, we're all good bird I'll watching. Bring jo- I'll bring my girlfriend Josie, and then uh, and we'll we'll help hook you up with some. We'll, we'll sort you out. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be another conversation, but yeah. But so, what was I, talk, what was I talking about now? So, what was I talking um, about? Oh, Maverick and gearing up for podcasts and things. Yeah, like, yeah. Well, um, with Maverick, because I know. Well, I'll tell, you, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a secret. It really helps if you're like, if you look really young, and uh, people just think you're the work experience kid. And even after like four years of being there, everyone still thinks you're the work experience kid. It's very, it's very, it's very disarming to a very masculine place. I think, like it, you know. I think, um, and I always, I found this in BSB, in British Supervice as well, when I was trying to do a bit of blogging and things like that with Paddock Chatter, um, getting photos, getting interviews, trying to write articles and things like that, learning my craft there. Um, fuck me, like, I mean, when you, when I actually got a real job, I was like, oh shit, I do nothing. <laughs> and I still know nothing now. So it's like, wow, it's a long way to go. Um, but the, um, the, something I've found, I've always found it very disarming in my, my entire life, to be honest, to be, to be quite fresh face looking. And also, especially if you just smile and say hello to anybody, even if they're like big and burly and a bit like a hard nut. Um, if, you know, they, they then look at you and it's funny, you would think they're like, oh, piss off. But actually, they're not. It's, they, it gets very disarming. And I think with, uh, I think the riders, because there's a lot of bravado and things there, but also a lot of it don't, like, I don't know whether people notice this or not, but fucking so many of those riders are so insecure when they get when they're with the media and, and on camera, and rightly so. Like it's the thing I've really come to notice. Even Moto Three kids, they're so nervous. Like bless them. Well, and well, so then at the point I realised, I was like, shit, you're just as nervous as me. Okay, this is fine then. <laughs> well, I, you, know you know what? In, in their in their defence, I think it's because most of them don't speak English or they speak that Brooklyn. Because <laughs> yeah. if you watch, and man, I, it hurt my heart though. If you watch some of those, like um, the uh, after they make poll, you know that at press. Conference after make after make poll, some of those guys you can just tell they're just like, please don't ask me a question. Like the Moto Three guys, because yeah, yeah, yeah. they don't have the English down, and and that's and 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 poor guys, because all they want to do is race. And I think, and that's why I would love to have Raul Fernandez on, but I don't think he speaks, you know, good enough English. And and I'm not trying he's to be. No, his English is good enough. He's just nervous as hell, man. Yeah, I, 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 I would love to have him on. I think I could make him laugh. And 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 what you, like what you did with Maverick, because Ma- back to Maverick, what you did with Maverick was you beautiful. Podcast or my Mike. Yeah, no, not not past Mike, but the, what you did with him on on the podcast because because I remember you said you really you and Fran really wanted to hit that one hard. You really wanted to like you know bring Maverick out, show people who the real Maverick was, and yeah. it was great because he was smiling, he was talking, and and what I always pictured about him how he said, hey, basically he said I'm kind of a loner. It's always me. I don't t- I don't show people with the inside me or whatever. And that's why I said bam. And that's what my connection with Maverick was, man. He's always been kind of a loner mm-hmm. where Rossi has Rossi has his big entourage. Dovey has his people, but Maverick's always been the dude who's alone. And I and I always like that about him, man. He's a, you can't yeah, yeah. you can't pinpoint and I love that. And you bought that out of I, him. I would say like, yeah, with 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 Maverick, I mean I'll be honest, like I, I, like for the love of God, don't ever show him this and things like that. I hope no one's going to write an article, but I feel, I feel actually quite sorry for him in that, for being a bit of a loner and things like that. I think, 
I think he's, uh, I don't know enough of his story. I'd love to know more about him, like his personal life and things that have gone on. But I think he needs some more best friends. He needs like a, a Tom for Fabio figure around him. I yes. really think he does. And I think that would benefit him so much as a human. Um, because he's he seems so bloody lovely, but the thing with that podcast is coming into um, going into it. Me and me and Fran just like bless him, Maverick last year and the last couple of years when it was going crap for him at Yamaha, and he was always saying, "Honestly, I feel good. Honestly, honestly," and you just knew he was freaking lying. <laughs> and I was getting so Pissy. like every time he's in a press conference, he's like, "Honestly, honestly," and it's like, Maverick, stop lying, please stop <laughs> lying. And um, and we want to just cut through that bullshit. We we yes. talked about it before. Um, we were just like. He, I do not want to hear him say, honestly. And also, I want to call him up on it and be like, mate, do you like to watch media all the time? And he was like, yeah, absolutely. And I'm like, there we go. You know, so people, when he says, honestly, he's not necessarily telling the truth. Sometimes he is, but, yeah. you know, and that was that was the main goal. And, yeah, I feel sorry for the guy. I like him a lot. He's like, as, a, as a human, he seems like a really decent bloke. You know what? I, I told Simon Patterson, I said, I said, you know what, Maverick, he needs me. He needs a strong black man in his side. I'll be the time <laughs> character just to go, hey, man, what the fuck? You know, we, we get to the, hey, look, man, what the fuck, Mav? I mean, what the yeah. fuck, dude? I mean, you're in the front row, and you went from first to 12th in, in one lap? I mean, what? Yeah, put your head out of your head. That's what hey, he needs. It's, it's, what, it's what we're talking about with Dobby. Yeah, they don't need yes men. Get yes men out. Guess yeah. Get yes men out of Merge EP. Get he, him gone. He needs a strong no brother needs. from the streets in his corner. That's what he needs. A strong brother from the streets. I mean, I'll roll my sleeves up like this. Always looks intimidating, right? I got a bald head already, right? I mean, that's what he needs, man. He needs a strong brother from the streets, from the USA, but pretty much, to tell him what's going on. Say, man, here's what you need to do, bro. When he's, when he's on the grid, before the race starts, they go, instead of giving him the fist bump, look here, man. And grab him like this, go, look here, man. Right. Okay. You're the best on this grid. All right. Now you get here and you show these motherfuckers what's up. And then go boom. And then and put a lid down like that and give him a pat on the butt. Like bam. He'll be like, well, I they guess it's need time. You, yeah. That's what he needs, brother. They need you. They don't need someone like me. I mean, well, <laughs> maybe, maybe it would work like from the other end of the stick because I'm the most weedy person ever. <laughs> but it's, I, I wear big jumpers to make myself a bit <laughs> more beefy than I actually am. And, and that, uh, not hard at all. Riding experience, minimal. And throwing it in hedges, like I don't know what I'm talking about, so I don't think it would have the same weight if I was giving them that. Sort See, that's of what we. But that's we why. Like that's else. why the paddock needs diversity. It needs people like me to come in and change the whole thing around. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. No, it's so true. It's so true. No, I love. Um, no, I love to do that. I would. Um, oh, one thing I was. I was just thinking about. Um, pass the mic. Um, that is uh, my favorite thing, by the way, to do. Is it? So I'm, glad, I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm glad you like it, too. It's Dude, my, no, I don't like it. I love it. Do. I don't like it. I yeah, love yeah. it. I mean, because it's great. If you watch the, uh, the the chemistry between Maverick and, and Miller, and it was like Maverick was kind of like, it was kind of like he was like, he was kind of like saying, in a way, I missed you. I miss you, Jack. And if you watch it, yeah. watch it again, it's kind of like, no, Jack, I missed you. We had fun. I mean, you know, it was like, yeah, yeah. we never had the a... dynamics are hilarious. Yeah. Like we, we never had an argument. We had fun. I mean, it, in a way, it's kind of like, oh, like it hit me in the heart different than I thought it would. You know, I thought it was, I thought it was great between Masia and, and, uh, and uh, Jorge Martin. I kind of liked that one. I, uh, but, that, was, that was the most... Um, trying to organize that was stressful, as it gets. Because... <laughs> um, that was obviously we booked to a Merge GP. I can't remember who we booked it with, but it was booked with Merge GP riders, and they didn't turn up. And I was like, "Who's friends?" <laughs> and like looking at the entire Merge grid, like, "Which of you guys are friends?" <laughs> um, you two, let's go. <laughs> right, those, um, you know, those like I would, I would like. So I'll give some, uh, give some major props to to our team. Literally, you know, the questions that are put in there are like, I don't think there's any interview apart from maybe the podcast as well like out there the Merge GP does which has as many people thinking about questions doing research on the riders and everything like goes into it every single episode we try and find we stalk their entire instagram profiles um we try and find any mention of interviews statistics this and that it is a lot of effort goes into that like I can tell. I can tell, and like I said, I love. I mean, that is my. Fa and I wish you guys would do more promotion on Instagram with that because that to me is gold, and I love it. But it's a hard. It's hard for me to find it. I find it on, on Facebook easier, and, and and on YouTube it's not caught up like it is on Facebook. So if you can get that more, yeah, because it's, uh, it's well, it's, it's actually part of our. I can, I can say it's because there was a press release about it. It's part of our exclusive Facebook. Okay. Deal. Okay. So okay. that goes. Um. So we have like ten series which go out exclusively on Facebook and then Instagram. 
uh, Instagram like a couple of days behind and things like that. So that's that's why that's why you've only got one episode on YouTube. Okay. Fortunately, unfortunately, like thank you Facebook for the deal, yeah. but also um, <laughs> but also I, I was it was initially designed when we came up with the concept um, to put it on YouTube. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Now, yeah. ask you now what when you first got the job, what yeah. was the part that surprised you the most when you first went to the paddock like what was like you were whoa like that, that you were blown away by good or bad um one thing that came to my mind uh initially was the how many people smoked um <laughs> i would say that uh but i'll, I'll glaze over that because that's the thing that popped in my mind eventually. um <laughs> what smoke uh, smoke or honest, smoke smoke cigarettes or my, smoke um, smoke hey smoke smoke or smoke cigarettes like uh, no, uh, smoke cigarettes. Okay, okay, okay. Just check. Yeah, well, he, like, well, here you gotta say. Like, in England, nobody smokes. Like, no, where I'm from, barely any of my friends. Like, some some of them would smoke on the night out, but like round pubs and stuff, there's barely any smokers at all. It was so I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. Uh, it was crazy. And then I realised that Spain and France are the same, and Italy. So like, everyone smokes. Okay. Those kids um, anyway, come out of the womb um, smoking, man. Think, but dude, I I did like me and 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 a lot of the Brits who were there. Um, I did uh, two nearly two four years working in that office in Barcelona, um, uh, learning the craft, learning about the sport, how everything works from the inside. And then we get unleashed, you would say. Not un not quite unleashed, but like sent out, like depending on what your job role is, to you get sent to a circuit for whatever reason, a test. I think, so what was my first event? I think my first event was going Barcelona test after the Grand Prix. So no fans, just bikes there. And yeah, the, the noise and the smell, um, just... Uh, the, uh, there's no, it's just a cliche shit. Yeah. <laughs> that thing blows you away. And then, like, the smell, as you know, what, something, something a lot of people don't realize the leathers smell have a really distinctive smell, don't they? Have you noticed that? No, I haven't been that close. I've been, I haven't when been that close. When riders are walking in their leathers, the smell of the leather is really quite strong. You're like, well, it's not necessarily a bad or good smell. I mean, it's probably a fucking terrible smell after <laughs> the recession, but when they've I've got fresh leathers going out, you're like, it's a really strong smell. Um, but yeah, that's, that's probably one thing. <laughs> I don't know why I think that's funny, but the way you it's say funny. shit is always it's funny. Random. It's, it's random thing. You know, like, I love about you is you call shit out though, that I go. And the one thing that annoys the fuck out of me is when the race is going on and they're showing a battle that, I mean, and you said it, you go, guys, guys, the race is up front, guys. Uh -oh. And I go, thank you. Because I'm sitting there going, why are you showing this when it's like, you know, you see a, gr a great battle made for first or second, third, it's Moto 3, so it's, you know, a battle from yeah, first through six. Yeah, yeah. And you're going, guys, guys, the race, come on, switch the director. And I'm like, good job, man. I mean, sir, I go, yes. Because, I mean, I think everybody has a collective yes because we get so frustrated when that happens and when there's a good race going. And yeah. for some reason, they feel the need to show the start again i don't give a shit about the start why are you showing the start again during the middle of a battle <laughs> no i mean i got i gotta be fair like to the to the guys in the tv truck like i was a bit uh, i was a bit over the line with that one um that was a little bit unfair, that was a bit too unfair of me um to be honest in that case but i think uh, i think we there's a lot going on with that murder we race but i think is there's some things like i would love um i think some, a lot of the things, and especially with with my my dear employers, with Dawn, there's a lot of things which people don't don't understand about the things that go on. Like in those every decision that goes on in that TV truck, I'm sure is it, like to a certain extent with certain people, it is like second nature. It's like when you're commentating or you're doing a radio show, a podcast, and things like that. You know, your all the all the knowledge in your head means that you can do things kind of automatically, right? Um, but in that, the amount of things that have to go into their heads at any one time of like uh, okay, here's the title sponsor, and they need X amount of time yes. to, of exposure on the boards there. That might be why you have a race start. Uh, the replay, maybe it's a super slow mode. You can get real good close-up of this rider who doesn't get much coverage in his team sponsors because they have to take notes and things like that. Like, I can't go into too many details, but like there's there's a reason for everything, really. But I was uh, I was pretty wound up in that, and pr and to be honest, pretty, I would just say, overtired in that motor race, and that's why I, I was a bit more... Um, <laughs> A bit more, uh, shall we say, fiery than than I normally get. <laughs> you know what? That M Moto E, I think, is the most underrated of all the classes because it's the it's the new kid on the block, and everybody's kind of old school. Like, you know, I want gas, whatever. But that was great. That was great racing. They smoked the tires coming out of the turn. Unbelievable. And, and man, and I just and I man, two years in a row, I just my heart sank because I wanted Bradley to win last year, and I was at Valencia when it happened. And it was just that weird feeling. And, I, and you know, and I didn't talk to him because I know me and I'm always real, like, you know, amped. 
And like we locked eyes when he went to the podium. And it was just a weird fit because I wanted him to win so bad and he didn't. And then this year, I'm also friends with Dominique. And he just got bowled over like a wrecking ball. What's his name? Came in like a wrecking ball. And, you know, and then like both races. And I'm, I just, I mean, and I love Jody Torres. Jody Torres is great for the sport. He's got that personality. He's awesome. You know, Spanish Elvis. And I'm glad, you know, and, and props to him. But, man, to me, it was Dominique's to lose. And he got, and I felt he just got screwed out. But that's racing. I mean, it was like, what can you do? I mean, that's part of racing. But, I, man, that my heart sank on that, man. I, it, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's uh, a lot of the races this year, I think, is um, uh, that every race basically has had loads of th things which made you go like, yes. And then, oh, <laughs> and like heartbreak and heart ache and things like that. Every single race in, in every category. And it's, it's pretty exhausting, to be honest. Like everyone's just knackered like fans. I, I like I spend so much time looking on, on Twitter and judging reactions to things. I like to see what people are talking about, feedback about things and. Yeah, the thing I can just tell from everybody is everybody's exhausted after a race weekend. <laughs> like yeah. people who work in it and people who just watching it. People don't realize that. Like, if I don't, there, there was a while I think in 2000. I think I want to say 16, maybe I don't know. But I was I went to like five or six races, and you know, of course the one here, and then I went to five in Europe. And you don't realize how tired you get because I'm one of those dorks that I have to go to every session. Like when Moto3, I, I have it down to a T. Moto3 happens, I'll get different places on the track. Moto GP comes out on track, I get around the straightaway. And then Moto2, I might go to the Alpine Stars Hospitality and watch it or I might different places on the track. But that entire weekend, you're so exhausted and so tired. But, it, but it's a good exhausted, you know what I mean? I love yeah. that. And being around the paddock. And I want to ask you this. What's the most, you've been around more, the guys closer than I have. Who's the most underrated underrated rider in moto three underrated oh shit you really put me on the spot there um underrated oh wow where you go this I dude right say here darren binder it like this first name wait give me a minute let me have a look let me have a look on the old uh oh the you're old cheating oh what you're cheating just now you've said that i'm like what riders do we have in moto three you're cheating um, <laughs> you're cheating oh my god but at least i got you i, I, I always I try to get that question where you go oh Shit, yeah. Um, who we got? So there's like uh, Yamanaka Garcia. Uh, maybe I mean like underrated. Obviously means that nobody is inside the top three of the championship and stuff, right? Um, and, and I would say and whatever. Like um, sometimes there a rider is better than his equipment or better than the team he's on. You know. Oh, um, uh, oh, I would say actually coming in this year is uh, Yuki Kuni. I hear 100%. nothing but great things about Yuki Kuni. I hear yeah, he yeah, is the yeah. shit. We, me and, um, where were we? Me and, me and Crayfar were in, uh, we'd gotten to Austria in our hotel and we were chatting to somebody who works in the talent program um, for Dorna, like the Asian Talent Cup and things like that were coming through. And uh, we, we had a good chat over lunch um, and just saying, um, Simon is always keen to, to learn more about the, the young riders and things like that. Simon, Simon Crayfar is one of the hardest like, workers in terms of just, is, is, is just taking that race of mentality to his job. Yes. Like leaving no stone unturned, really. Right. Um, and he was just so easy to put the question like, which of the kids do we need to look out for? The ones who are in current Moto 3 World Championship and then ones who are Junior World Championship. And they went, uh, Yuki Kuni. Yuki Kuni, when he comes, like, he, he gets it going, he's going to absolutely Kill it. be a weapon. Um, if it wasn't for his injuries last year in uh, Reb, which he got in the Red Bull Rookies race, and then also when uh, he clattered into John McPhee's bike, yes, in yes. Uh, if it wasn't for those, he was, in their words, going to walk the World Championship, the Junior World Championship, and Red Bull Rookies. Wow, he's, he's really, 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 really good. Okay. So, um, but I think he's so he's a year older than what like the sort of the general trend is with those um, uh, with the Age Talent Cup kids. I mm -hmm. think so. He's like. I think he spent a year longer or something in the junior world championship than, than they normally have them there before moving up to the world championship. But that's because he's been injured quite a lot of the time, unfortunately, but he's, he's a, he's a real, really fast kid. Well, I got that from you guys. I remember that. I remember you guys saying it and I've been, and I've yeah. watched him since that. I remember you guys saying that and I've specifically watched for him who underrated in moto three, most underrated in moto three. I mean, moto two, moto two, underrated in moto two. Uh, Probably one of the guys who's having a shit time of it right now, um, Navarro and Baldessari. Oh, um, it, but they're not. Bald, like, they're Baldi not hurts my Everyone heart. Everyone knows how good they are, but 
Yeah. Baldy's hurting my heart. I love that kid. He is, yeah. I mean, he's a fun kid. Every time I see him at the after party, he's always saying hi. And I don't know what it is, but man, he's having a shit year. You, but you, you, I love how you, you're always saying, like, oh, yeah, you would know this more than me. You would know this more than me. And you're like, all oh, these after parties have been to. I asked for see a press question in the press conference. I'm like, I got an alpha class hospitality to watch. I'm like, I haven't done any of these things. Like, you are way more experienced than me. But you're getting paid for it, buddy. You're getting, I pay, <laughs> I pay. You're getting paid for it. But no, I, I feel for him and Navarro. Navarro puts yeah. in the work. Work and it's like he just you know it's just one of them years, man. I mean, where he you just can't you just go you know what I want this year to be over. I mean, and funny, I, it's a funny game and it like I yeah I just um I think there's a few people who want this year to be over. A few people who've kind of I think I think in some ways actually I think Bowder and um and Navarro are quite fortunate out in this whole situation. They're still they're doing they're having a shit year, no no question. But if this was a normal year. Um, this year was, as we know, was the contract years for all those for like maybe seven big seats in MotoGP. Yeah. And at the start of the year, I actually had a, um, I had a notepad and a lot of notes of when we came into the off season for all the social media team. And we were for the first year ever, it was, I was so bummed, bummed out by this because, um, we had this whole season planned out all these potential storylines coming through, uh, who's going to be like, what riders could be coming through to be going, uh, to MotoGP 2021. And all of it just went out the window because of freaking COVID. Right. And um, and but we I had this whole uh, notepad of like so and so could be going here, so and so could be and, like you have Navarro, Digia, um, Bezecchi, Marini, Bastianini, um, Baldessari. If I already mentioned him, like all of those guys could have moved up. But hell, fuck it. I mean, if they if they um, had the year which they're having now under normal circumstances, they would have kind of been screwed. Like with the with the rider market, I think actually having an extra year to get their shit together again, which is going to happen, it's got to, um, and all those contracts coming around again for 2022 or 2023, whenever it is. Yeah, I think they're kind of fortunate. Well, I, you know what? I I think no one was expecting Bezeki to catch on like he did. But I mean, we talk about Marini. But Bezeki yeah. is the I mean he's the man he's been in the top three or four yeah, yeah. and he and he was st he's still hurt with his leg he still got the injury yeah, I, I, he, he's still limping I, gonna, I, I will I don't like to I don't like claim a lot of things and things like that but like I'm I will say I did know Bezeki was special from um from the moment he stepped on the KTM motor three really because I was very that was one thing which I was like I had a feeling in my mind then when I and I still know nothing now, but like I didn't know shit when I first started traveling. And I went to this, uh, I went to this first test. One of my favorite stories about him, and I'll tell it to the cows come home about him. Please. So he had just been on that uh, Mahindra, uh -huh. and he got to on this KTM February 2018, and we we're in Valencia for those first official preseason tests. And at the end of every day, I had to do a top five interview. Yeah. With these guys, and that's what you do when you when you go to the preseason test for the broadcasters. It gets sent around. I don't know to who. Um, we go and interview them in English and then the native language. So Bezeki was first day, he was top five. I think he was like fifth in this test. So I interviewed him and I went to speak to him and, and I wanted to get, a, and I introduced myself. I was like, I'm going to be a free practice commentator from OGB.com this year. Like, good to meet you. And he was like, oh, you've got hair like me. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he was really nice. And his English was, and he was giving me such thorough answers when he's in pre style GP. And, I, and after the camera went off, I liked to have a, which I then realized the cameraman really didn't like. Um, I had quite a good, I always took a couple of minutes to chat with him and the cameraman was like waiting around like, can we fucking go please? And I'm there like, so tell me where you grew up and things like that, you know? <laughs> and, um, and so I said to him things that I was like, uh, I went to see him on the second day uh -huh. and then on the third day, he was the, uh, sun was setting and I've got a photo of it on my Instagram. He was at 6 PM when the, when the checkered flag came out, he was still doing laps and not everybody else had stopped at like 5 PM. He was still going like, to the point his team were on the pit bull waving the pass going like box, box, box. And he just kept coming through and they were just sort of flying their hands up in the air, not angry, like smiling, like this kid loves it. And when he came in, yeah, I said like, shit, you, you really, you were enjoying yourself. And he was like, it's so good to be on a bike, which is weak, which can turn and is great. And we're having a good chat. And he was saying things, I asked him like, why is your English so good? And he was like, well, the VR46 Academy let us have, um, give us two lessons of English per week. But I asked for a third one to improve my technical knowledge because this team's German and none of them speak Italian. So I need to learn better English. And I was like, fuck, this kid has wow. got some real, real drive. And then he got his first win in Argentina, round two. And I, I saw him then in part for me because I'd seen him in the test after that where he was fast again, fast again. Uh, he was fast in the leading group in guitar that time, but got taken out by Cornfall, his teammate. 
and I knew from then he was going to be pretty bloody special. And when and when freaking Valentino Rossi's on pit wall waving you over the line in Argentina when you're taking your first win in like you're like three, four, five, however many however many seconds it was that he was ahead of everybody else yes. in those kind of conditions. Yes, that kid's really fucking special. And that kid, that bike he was on last year, the KTM. We all know it wasn't very good, yeah, to say the least. Yes, and so I knew as soon as he got on that that Calyx, he was going to be fucking great, and he will, and he's been been there from the start. The man, I what I loved about him, and I could tell it was going to be good, was the passion he had when he lost that championship, yeah, and yeah. he was crying, and I go, that kid's got it. And don't get me wrong, he, I think they all have a passion, <laughs> but man, I mean, he, he had it to where they had to like like you know come over like intervention, like hey, yeah. it's going to be okay. And he, I mean, you know, I think the cameraman felt guilty even capturing those moments. He was so despondent. So I love Baseki, and here's the guy that, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. I uh, personally think. Celestino Viete is going to be the next great one, and that's just me. Who do you? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Viete, hundred um, percent. The just because, like, I mean, I mean, I would, I would encourage anyone listening to like take my opinion with a bit of a pinch of salt. Like, there are people who know way more about riders and rider spotters than me. Same like, here. I don't know shit compared to them. Same but here. But there's just a couple of things which tell me of from what I've been speaking to other people. Like Neil Morris is such a freaking oracle of everything. Stephen Bertie, absolute oracles, and like Simon and Amy. You know, the, those guys are like, they are the real experts. Right? Right. And I learn from them every week. But like some of the things which you can really pick up and things that genuinely has made us all go was when um, Vietti was able to, last year, he was like 28th at the end of Friday. Yes. You know, and then he was, and then for like Q1, he'd get through and then he qualified quite well. Or he'd still be relatively far down, but in the race he'd do a Darren Binder and be up in the top three. And, and, and then I think somebody talked to him. They go, "Hey, listen, if you qualify better, you know, maybe and and, and you run with the top group, you can finish better." And I think somebody talk, put something in his ear, and he's been doing that. And I knew he was going to be special when Bulaga went out with that injury, and he replaced Bulaga and got better oh, results okay. than Bulaga did. And I was like, "This kid is something special." Yeah. So which leads he's, me to my—he's got the—he's uh, got the old uh, pork chops as well coming in. Yeah, he's, <laughs> yeah he's, he's, a, he's a blast from the past. That's why I like him. I well, even tried to grow some. Look, look see, they're not too bad. You're hitting puberty. <laughs> A, wind, a swift breeze will blow him off. Because of the You're hitting puberty finally, man. You're hitting puberty yeah, finally. It's about. Okay, so who's going to win Moto 3 and who should win Moto 3? Oh, that's a good question. Um, in many, I think, um, uh, to be honest, I, I think Arenas is a different character this year. I think he probably will. Um, Unless Vietti keeps riding that wave, um, I think he can. I, I, I think um, like should should be uh, Albert or John McPhee. Really, one of those two should be the winners. Just in terms of like the form and things like their experience. Here's here's what sticks out to me is I agree with you on Arenas. I like what he's doing. He, he's riding like a veteran that he is, but. What I love is Viette is in his head a little bit because I forget what round it was. Viette just went through like, hey, man, I'm the one with the big dick here. And he came through. And then on the Instagram, Arenas was like, hey, um, remember, he, he kind of called him out on it. And I forget what the exact word, but he kind of called him out, which means he's in his head because he remembered that and he put that on his Instagram. So if I was Viette and I saw that, I would, I would fuck with him even more. I mean, you got four more rounds to go, man. And Vietti, to me, Vietti's old school, man. He ain't trying to make no friends. It's Moto 3, period. You know how Moto 3 is. I got to tell you. He's, he's, got his, he's got his buds in the VR46 Academy, and apart from that, he's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which which I thought was maybe not. But I thought one of the funniest things ever. What I love about Darren Bender. Remember when he he crashed. Somebody crashed him as he's sliding. He flipped the guy off while he's sliding. He crashed. He's crashing. I'm talking about <laughs> producer. He's sliding and he's going like this to the guy he uh, that made him crash. <laughs> that to me is talent. When you crash and instead of worrying about oh, I'm gonna be okay, you go. You know what? Fuck you, man. I mean, serious. I mean. That's what that to me is what Darren Bender. If he, when he starts winning, he wins the championship. That dude sponsorship is going to go through the roof. He's a good looking dude. Right. He's got the locks. I mean, he takes you know a hairnet off and he does this, and girls go, "Oh my god!" I mean, he's yeah. got it all, man. And if he starts winning, forget about it. Forget well, you saw it in the uh, in past the mic when it was like, "Who's the better looking brother?" And yeah. Brad was like, "You, bro," and Dan was like. <laughs> Yeah, like, <laughs> no. know, I love those. Dudes. I love those dudes. Okay, Moto Two. Who's going to win? The, who's going to win the championship? And who should win the championship? Moto Two. 
Um, I, do you know what? It's nothing to do with me being a Brit, but I think Sam Lowe's is going to win it um, because the, because the other lads. bezeki has got another year, right? Marine's yeah. probably off to MotoGP. Mm-hmm. The other lads they view Moto Two as their stepping stone. They want they really want that world championship. Don't get me wrong, they really want the world championship, especially because they're not won one yet. Um, but for them, it's still as part of the process and the stepping stone into MotoGP again. And I think Sam's probably quite aware that a MotoGP ride for him now, no matter what he does in Moto2, yes. is pretty unlikely, um, to say the least. I mean, I hope he doesn't get unfair with me for saying that or anything like that. But for Sam, that Moto2 championship is his holy grail. And he's keeping so calm. I don't know what he's done or what he's got around him. He's, he's, so he's calm. He, he's it's good. a redemption, which I love about him. It's a re- and also, yeah. and I'm glad you said that, because I felt that Johan Mir treated Moto2 the same way as a stepping stone. Because I, I didn't... I, you, I just got the feeling that he knew he was going to GP, and it's not like he didn't care, but it's when like... did they announce it? Did they announce it, like, just after... I think with him, it was just after, like, Austin in 2018. Yeah, right? and it was like, okay, I'm gone, so I really don't care. I mean, that's, yeah. that's kind of the way I felt about it. So I like what we think about it, but I think it's going to connect between Lowe's and Marini, and I think that will be a great battle. I can't yeah, wait for yeah. that. That's going to be awesome. And I also want to ask you about, what's up with that, uh, your, uh, your cardboard uh, cutout of Sandro Cortese? <laughs> oh my god, that's some good research. Who told you that? It's an ancient Chinese secret. <laughs> my god, that's really good. Oh wow. Okay, this is a fantastic story. Oh my god. This part of, this is actually you know, there's so many things which I was like uh, coming into like bloody hell, what's he gonna ask me about? And then um and how much would I you know, I don't know if I'll ever get asked, I probably won't ever get asked to be a podcast guest again after this, but um <laughs> I've ruined but you. like my god, that that was one of the stories I'm like, when I say this? But I guess I have to now. Um, so Valencia party, second one? First, no. Yes, second one, I think. Yeah, second one, 2017. Um, well, we were in this hotel in the um, in in the middle of uh, Valencia by the arts and sciences section. It's got like all these really cool white buildings and things. And it was quite a nice one. And Liquimoli and uh, were staying there because they had like some sponsorship event on it. All week, there was this... Sandra Cortesia, Marcel Schrotter, cardboard cutout, life size, and uh, in like the, the breakfast thing. And then they had an event on when the Sunday night, uh, when Saturday night came around. I think we were having dinner in the bar, mm-hmm. or like, no, just a couple of drinks after having some dinner. And this feels weird. Do you know, what, do you know what's weird about the situation? Telling you, oh, we're having some dinner in the bar together, felt like, oh no, I'm breaking protocol. <laughs> you know, I think that was like being naughty. That's how used to this new normal we are. Anyway, um, I missed those times. We're having a beer, and I think it was Steve or Bertie went and took a look at the thing, and they were like, "If that Sandra Cortese cardboard cutout is still here tomorrow night, we should take that to the after party." And we were like, "That would be funny." <laughs> had a good joke about it. Next night comes around, and we've had like a few too many before we even going out. And then I'd go up and ask the the Camelli guys, "Hey guys, do you mind if we take Sandra with us?" They're like, "No, no, we've had our event." Right. So Sandra came and had drinks with us at the bar whilst we were like having free drinks before going to the party. I think it's just yeah. the party it didn't open its doors until twelve. So then uh, we took Marcel Schrutter with us there, and the first person we meet when we walk into the uh, he was he was actually no that was funny because we were a bit <laughs> we were a bit intoxicated, so we were trying to put him not folded up into the taxi, and the taxi driver just in the end just went fera, fera, fera. We're just like, wait wait wait. Oh, did he break up? Uh, Oh, did he break up? Put it in. No, he didn't break it up. Just then, anyways, we go to the party, and I bring him out, and a couple of others have got there before us, and then they were waiting outside for us, and then I went round to the booth, set it up, brought him out, and just held him above my head like we've got him, and everyone's like yes. And then, uh, oh, I've got low battery. You still there? Yeah, I'm still here, buddy. Hello. Yeah, I'm still here. You back? Um, and um, yeah, and then uh. <laughs> Start walking, the first person we see is Marcel. <laughs> and then he phones his teammate at the time and he phones Sandra. He's like, Sandra, you're here. And he's like, No, I'm not. I'm in my bedroom or something like that. And he's like, No, you are. And then he like sent him a photo and pretty hilarious. So then we started taking him around. He was having photos with everybody. <laughs> Dominique Egter snogged his face off. Um, Hafish was just in the corner having like a having a Coca-Cola just quietly in the corner. So we made him have a photo. He looked kind of awkward. Uh, little did we know he was gonna be a Moto GP rider next year. What the fuck? You know, things that are kind of weird. When I look back at that photo of Hafish and what a different character he was then, I yeah. was like, little did he know he was going to be a MotoGP <laughs> rider. Yeah. And then uh, 
uh, and then I launched him off the top roof because um, <laughs> we, the, I was just kind of bored with it, with it and lugging it around because I had to take it everywhere. And it was life size. It was actually taller than me, for God's sake. So I launched it off the roof, and there's a beautiful video of it. And I was like, we're going to launch him off the roof. There you go. And then what you can't see in the video, but I remember it so vividly. I just remember seeing it going, doo, and then it went in somewhere. It went in back in the club in a window, like scooped down. He didn't want to leave the club. <laughs> I was like, where did he go? <laughs> like, what happened? So we went downstairs. Turns out he went into the women's bathroom. <laughs> just like floated right over the cubicles and into the thing there. So I just imagine these poor women sat there peeing and sit down or, or doing whatever they do. You know when girls go to the loo, they go in there for hours and you're like, no, I don't want to do it. Okay. I don't want to. <laughs> they must have just been sat there and it's like Sandra Cortez just floating over their heads. <laughs> and then uh, later on, I think, uh, someone punched his punched the head off. And was like, no, that's, that's kind of not very nice. You shouldn't do that. I was kind of, I was kind of. That was that was an example. You know, we were talking about earlier how um, how like I think a lot of guys find me quite disarming because yes. I'm quite childish. Yes. He, this guy, I don't know who he is. He was some like tag along which which get um you know some like guest of a rider who got like things. So basically, he's clearly there. He's like got his aftershave on, and I don't like to shit on people too much. But this dude was there to like pick up girls, right? And he was clearly like, I'm going to be a hard man. So he decided to freaking ruin people's fun by punching Sandra's head off. I'm like, do you think you're hard? Like, do you, do you actually think you're, you're a hard bloke doing that? Like, good job, mate. But then we decided, like, let's not get, let us get down. So we took Sandra's head down to the, down to the dance floor. And we had, like, Lorenzo was like, dancing and things like that. And, uh, yeah, Sa Sandra had a great night. I actually then met him the next no, it was, it was a year and a bit later when he was doing some commentary for German TV. Yeah. And uh, I was walking. So the commentary box in Jerez on the grandstand opposite the pit lane. It's like a 20-minute walk uh, in the 40-degree heat or whatever it is. Yeah. And um, I got beneath the grandstand, and he was there. And I was like, oh, Sandro, hi. And he was like, hello. Didn't know who I was. And I went, you've not met me, but I met you, kind of. I took your cardboard cutout to the Valencia party. He was like, Oh, that was you, Alana. Alana Fellows, who, who worked in World Superbike Send, now for BT Sport. Yeah. Oh, she told me about that. Yeah. Oh, thanks for making me have such a great night. <laughs> that was it. So that was um, still to date, probably one of the funniest like nights I think we've ever had. So, That's um, great. I gotta, yeah, it was, was really good times. I got to hang out with you for the next, next year in Valencia for the after party. <laughs> I think we'll have a good time. Yeah. Man. What are we even going to do this year? I don't even know. I don't know what's going to happen. Nah, like, you'll be in Portugal. You know? You'll be in Portugal locked down, and I'll, I don't know what I'll be, but man, oh my God, man, I could go on and on. I got the thing to wrap it up. I swear I wanted to go more. We got we to do a part two, Matt. We got to do a part two. Yeah, right. I knew it was going to be fun. I knew it was going to be fun, though, so I can't say I, I, this was unexpected. I knew, it was I knew you were going to be fun. I could always tell. Like I said, the way you do the, the races, I knew for I knew this is how it was going to be, and you were a delight, a delight, oh, and I appreciate you. Real quick, like, you do, the, you do yours. I'm going to do my top five. So coffee or tea? Uh, coffee, 100%. Oh, are you serious? You guys are mostly Insta tea. Also, also, everyone's going to hate me. Instant coffee. I like I love I love proper press coffee and things like that, but my get up is instant. I like, get it in me. Let's go. <laughs> Let's cafe gold. Shout out. <laughs> he's I told you he's great. Okay. Um the Moto three title, uh the Moto Three champion this year is Oh my god. Moto three uh, champion this Albert year Reynolds. is Moto Two champion is Sam Lowe's. Moto G P champion is I'm going to say Fabio Quattararo. Ah, oh, look at you. Okay. And I, even though you love them all, your favorite interview to date. Your favorite interview to date. Oh, did he, did he go out? Oh, there we go. Don't uh, tell him about um, how, I, uh, how I stalked him in Minneapolis. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's accidentally. Right. Like, I, it's in the interview. It's just we're in the same hotel. I remember that because uh, it was for a Supercross. Same hotel. Yeah, it was Supercross, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Was yeah. that the same one? A hotel that uh, Marquez was in? No, he was in. He was in a different one. He was downtown. We were we were midtown, and I think holy shit, like um, where it all kicked off um in the in the protests uh, was exactly where the hotel was. Wow. I, I walked to long where. 
borrowed a suitcase to up when it opened up, and I was like, it was like clearly we both booked it last minute. Yeah. Uh, I literally booked that hotel proper the last minute, and then, yeah. and then we were, me and him were there, and in the same one, I was like, ah, clearly booking.com. Last <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, good story, but I can tell that story another time as well. Oh, man. Matt, thank you so much for your time, buddy. I mean, no I enjoy watching you, all that you've done for GP and for Moto3, which I think is the most exciting class in racing because these are the future stars of today. And when and when he gets yeah. it, when he gets it, I'm going to say Raul Fernandez is going to be the next best. When he gets it, I'm going to give him next year probably. And I think he's going to be on fire. I, that's one of my favorite riders. He's going to be on fire. So I can't wait to talk to you again. More MotoGP. Be nice to Neil. He's a good dude. Be nice to Neil. And I can't wait to hear you. I'm always nice to Neil. Me and, me and him have a... <laughs> me and him talk all the time. We're, we're good. We're, I, love, I love Neil so much. He knows that. Tell Neil he's next. Tell Neil he's next. So, all right. So I'll be listening to you guys Friday morning. Yeah, Cannot right. wait, buddy. Friday morning, okay? Until then, thank you so much, Matt, for your time. Thank you for watching Tales from a Gemini. Like I say around this time after every interview, you know the word. Peace.